Welcome to the Author Your Life podcast, where you can write a new script for your life and become the hero of your story. I'm your host, David McRae. You are the author of your life. Let's get started. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Author Your Life podcast. Today, we are making history here on the podcast. For the very first time on Author Your Life, we have a married couple on the podcast. In this episode and next week's episode, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the Carmichaels. The Carmichaels are two individuals who I met at a seminar across in America a couple of years ago. I've kept in touch with them. They both do really great work, both together as a couple and also with individual projects. And I thought they'd be fantastic people to get on the show. So this is a two-parter. In today's episode, we're going to have the lovely Brittany Carmichael. And in next week's episode, we're going to have Chris Carmichael. So first of all, let's introduce the lovely Brit. Brittany Carmichael is the founder of Shine School, an online course to help women awake their authentic self and shine from the inside. She's a trailblazing light worker, psychic medium, hairstylist, empowerment coach for female entrepreneurs, and she's 99% unicorn. Brit teaches people how to shine from the inside by breaking free of negative beliefs, letting go of limiting labels, and tapping into creative power so they can confidently trust their intuition to live life with intention in her 90-day soul coaching intensive. Named a beauty guru by Behind the Chair, Brit offers powerful inside-out transformations in her luxury vegan hair salon, OMG Hairstyles, in Frisco, Texas. She is also known for her inspiring impact in her online community, hashtag Shine Tribe Sisterhood, intuitive insights on her famous Woo Woo Wednesday tarot readings, and her local goddess gathering where Brit guides women through meditations, release rituals, and intention setting to release what holds you back and turn your dreams into reality. Her mission is to inspire women to create a soul-filled life that's full of purpose and passion and peacefulness. After overcoming decades of a lack of self-love, Brit has become a firm believer that holistic healing and self-care must be the foundation for conscious living and intentional leadership. Experiencing breakthroughs in her personal life and business, she is passionate about supporting women exploring their own unique gifts and helping them share their message with the world. In our interview together, you are going to learn. You don't have to divide life into work and play. You can move between both throughout the day. Why we should stop saying no to kids. That to be a giver, you have to be selfish. Life is not about achievements. It's about the energy you bring to your actions. And most importantly, why what you put after I am is powerful. So I really enjoyed doing this interview with Britt and Chris. I hope you enjoy this new dynamic and this new energy that we have on the show. Without any further preamble, please enjoy this interview with Brittany Carmichael. Brittany, welcome to the Off Your Life podcast. Thank you so much for having me, David. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on. So, Brittany, let's hear a little bit more about you and your story. Why did you become a coach? Why did you get into business? Why are you where you are today? Yep. So, let's start from the beginning. When I was six years old, I used to collect beer cans, like aluminum cans, from my trailer park neighborhood. So my entrepreneurial spirit runs deep. And I remember this amazing story my dad told. He said, uh, he took me to go exchange the cash or the cans for cash and the man was eating and his mouth was full and he said, 
oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be talking with my mouth full. And I said, oh, as long as you're talking cash, I don't care. So <laughs> my entrepreneurial spirit started at a very young age, and that led me to open up my own hair salon when I was 20 years old. I grew up in a really small country town where there wasn't a lot of opportunity, and um, to think about opening your own hair salon was crazy. That was like a, for the big shots, you know. But I looked around, and I thought, no one's doing it the way that I feel like it should be done. It should be a place of inspiring and empowering and helping women to feel beautiful, not just look beautiful. And there were so many salons I went into that it was all about perfection and, you know, and that's just not something to live up to. So coaching naturally started easing its way into my business. I didn't realize I was doing it at the time, but every time a woman would sit down in my chair and tell me how much she hated her face or this or she doesn't like her laugh or she hates her job or she's in a terrible relationship, I would just naturally ask questions like, well, why are you still doing that or why are you allowing that or what holds you back from trying something new? And I didn't realize I was coaching at the time. I just thought I was having good conversation. But looking back over the last few years and honestly the entire time as a, as a hairdresser, I like to call myself a hairapist, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I realized I've been coaching. And so about two or three years ago, I decided, you know what, <laughs> to be honest, I'm getting tired of getting paid as a hairdresser, but being a life coach, a business coach, a freaking mentor, you know? So I decided that I would take my business online and, and spread my message, my story, my transformation, my um, overcoming my struggles and fears and weights and all these problems that I was going on in my life, I started listening to the woman sitting in my chair going, oh, well, you know, you can just change that. You know, you could just stop eating like shit or you could just stop allowing some of this stuff in your life. So then I started looking at my own life going, oh, I need to do some of these things that I'm telling other people to do. So I didn't become a coach until I went through my own coaching program, healing, transformation. And once I healed, I lost 75 pounds. I um, fell in love with life. I fell in love with myself because I spent 30 years hating myself. Um, I realized, oh my God, I have so much to give. I have to start uh, empowering other people to step into their authentic truth and to believe that they're worthy and that they can go after their dreams. So coaching um, was a natural progression from being a hairdresser and I have been a coach forever, but <laughs> I've been being paid as a coach for the last three years or so. <laughs> You, you hinted there just about your, your own personal transformations and your journey that you've gone through. Um, would you care to describe a little bit more about what was going on for you and some of the shifts that you had to make to get to where you are now? Absolutely. So like I mentioned, I grew up in a really small country town. There was less than 3,000 people in my town. So it's safe to say that everyone knows your shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the second you do something that's not according to society, everybody knows about it. And I was that person. I was the trailblazer. I was the weirdo. I was the one dressing differently. I was the one with pink hair. I was the one just trying to express my unique, authentic unicorn self in a rural country town. And because of that, I, say, I always like to say you can't fit a star in a square-shaped box. And society, to me, is the square-shaped box. <laughs> and so because of that, sure, I grew up spontaneous, and I had this carefree, wild, um, I want to be myself um, uh, personality. But because of growing up in a small Texas town, let me also put that out there, um, it was very small-minded, and it was you need to look like everyone, sound like everyone, talk like everyone, be like everyone, don't stand out. And because of that, there was a schizophrenic terror in my own system. And I was like, but I want to be like this. My soul says I'm supposed to be like this, but society says I'm supposed to act this way. So there was a long period of my life where I repressed who I really was, trying to fit in and trying to be like everyone else, trying to wear the Abercrombie and Fitch. Like, who spends $50 <laughs> on a fucking t-shirt? That's crazy. It's crazy. So I, I went through a series of depression and of course we all want to kill ourselves when we're not being who we really are because we're asking for change. That's really what depression and um, suicidal thoughts really are stemming to, that there's change for better, that there's something better in your life that is asking you to step up and play. And we are given such limited resources with how we make those changes in our life that we either, you know, something drastic and traumatic has to happen or we try to kill ourselves and it fails or we stay depressed for long enough and we suffer long enough that we choose to change. 
Well, a little bit of all that happened. <laughs> So like I said, I was coaching women behind the chair and then realizing, well, I'm 200 pounds, I'm overweight, I'm unhappy, I'm overworked and completely out of balance. And then in 2012, bam, my mom had a massive stroke that paralyzed her. And that's when my real wake-up call started happening. I was overweight, sure, but I wasn't, I wasn't suffering enough because I was still doing the same habits and the same lifestyle. But when my mom had this massive stroke, I had to pause and go, okay. What's happening here? Like life is short and she almost didn't wake up. And so that got me thinking about my own life. Well, if we're only here a short period of time and we don't know how long we have, I better start making some changes. And so in 2012, I started making those changes. I started saying no when I mean no. I started putting boundaries at work and, and I stopped working until midnight every night because oh I can't make it in until then I mean what kind of schedule are you on anyway like I started changing the way that I was eating I went from yo-yo dieting to this fad diet to that keto diet to that paleo diet to a plant-based lifestyle that I've now sustained for the last six years and it's kept 75 pounds off um, and I started making changes on the way that I was talking to myself because I said for the last 30 years I hated myself so I had to take a look at my internal dialogue and create awareness around how am I acting and treating myself and then how does that affect the way that I act and treat other people and I realized that when I stop judging myself I stop judging other people so I had to really take a holistic approach to all the different areas of my life my physical body my mental state how I'm thinking about things how I'm processing things I had to take a look at all these different categories of life and I just slowly started chugging away at this category here this category here this category here until I lifted all the levels of what I think life is consistent of relationships business and finance uh, fun and joy spiritual growth physical health mental peace <laughs> yeah. and I started building up all those categories just slowly over time like I would ask myself what do I need right now well my physical body's tight I need to exercise or I need to do some yoga or stretch and I began this new lifestyle this new approach of living with awareness and intention where every morning I'd wake up and say what do I need most right now because once my mom finally was able to regain speech I asked her this very powerful question mom why did you do this to yourself and I was learning law of attraction at the time and so I didn't we don't we don't beat around the bush I just went like you did this why and she knew it she said because everybody needed something from me and in that moment I realized oh my god I'm gonna be my mom if I don't make a change mm -hmm. I'm gonna be overweight I'm gonna end up with diabetes I'm gonna end up having a stroke because I'm ignoring what my body's telling me and I'm trying to give to everyone else and what we think in life as spiritual beings that we're supposed to give, 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 be of service, be of service. And yes, that is true. But what we've forgotten is that we have to give to ourselves first. And so the real transformation happened when I shifted from trying to put everyone else first, which seems like the noble thing to do. And I actually became selfish and put myself first and filled my own cup and did my self-care rituals in the morning. And then from that filled place of overflowing love, then I can give freely to other people. So the transformation happened when I started putting myself first and it sounds crazy and that's why everyone's suffering because they're not they're not willing to try it. They think it sounds so bad but how is it working for you in your life right now? Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting, interesting you were sharing there that, that your, your, your mom, mom was the catalyst, the catalyst for your change. your change. And I think it's interesting that sometimes it's other people who who create this change for us and sometimes we start thinking and caring more about other people than we think and care about for ourselves and sometimes we always also need that that external stimulus to make it happen but what I'm guessing is that whilst your your mom was the change for you yes we can have this this thing that happens in our lives that makes us want to change but just because we make that decision to change doesn't make it any easier to change. We've still got to put in the hours. We've still got to put in the reps to make it happen. For you on your journey, what was motivating you through this process? Yes, you'd made the decision to change. But what helped you go on and actually make the change when so many people don't? 
you know, they say you change be because you're either moving away from pain or you're moving towards pleasure. And I feel like it was a little bit of both for me. It was the pain of continuing to be 200 pounds and go, you know, losing some weight and then gaining it back and losing some weight. I was really tired of that. I was tired of beating myself up all the time and saying, I, I hate myself. I'm fat. I'm not pretty. I'm not good enough. So the pain was enough to push me forward. And then the idea of the pleasure of, you know what, I can love myself. I can be beautiful. I can be healthy. The idea that it was possible was the, the other half of that motivation that was pulling me forward. So it was a little bit of push from the pain like to get away from it. Like, I'm fucking sick of this. How many of you feel like, God, I'm just fucking sick of this shit. Like, I'm sick of this life. Like, what the hell? I had that moment. And that was enough to make me go, okay, whatever I was doing. And my life wasn't that bad. You know, we look back and on paper, it wasn't too, I was doing, I'm doing good. But it doesn't matter. We could be billionaires and still miserable. So it doesn't matter if we have money or if we have the perfect relationship or anything like that. It's all how we perceive it. And so this idea that you could live a life of joy and pleasure and, and passion and abundance was enough to make me curious to go, hmm, well, that sounds pretty nice. If that's possible for other people, then it has to be possible for me. And so I think curiosity uh, paired with just being fucking sick and tired of not, like, enjoying life. I mean, do you, I'm sure you can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was something else that you mentioned in your story that I thought was interesting talking about being selfish and having to fill up your own cup now obviously you have this balance in your life that you make a living through helping other people but you also recognize the need to take care of yourself first and when you fill up your own cup then you have water to give to other people for you on a day-to-day -day basis what are you doing to make sure that you are filling your own cup so that you can give to others? Yeah, I slow down a lot in my life. Um, we're so used to filling up the empty space with to-dos and tasks. And if I'm not being productive, then I'm not, you know, like, I'm not worthy or doing good at life or whatever we judge ourselves by. So for me, my day-to-day -day is work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. It's not work, 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 rest, it's a beautiful balance of back and forth. And I'm a Libra too, so <laughs> when things are out of balance, I'm like this. <laughs> so I wake up and the first hour to two hours is me doing journaling, tea time, yoga, taking a walk outside, spending time with my husband, nobody else involved. No emails, no social media, no requests, no complaints. No, no, nothing. It's just me. And so in that two hours, that gives me enough time to go, what do I need to get done for today? What do I, what do I feel like today? Am, did I wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Because if I did, then I need to maybe be more mindful about tuning into my mindset and maybe some of the thoughts that I'm thinking. Or maybe today my body hurts. So it's really about showing up with intention and presence each day instead of just going through the motion. So many people are on habit autopilot that they wake up and they do the whole routine every single day it looks the same. For me, I like to choose a different day every day for myself. So there's not one day that is a is a replica. It's not wake up 9 to 5, come home kids, eat sleep. It doesn't look like that at all. It's completely different. And so because of that, I have to choose uh, consciously what I'm doing with my time. So I'll spend 50 minutes emails, creating, social media, whatever, whatever, whatever I got to do in my business and then for 10 to 20 minutes I get up, I stretch, I take a walk outside, come back and I repeat the process. So my breaks are actually built into my work like my work hours. I don't wait until I've worked five hours and now I deserve a break because I'm exhausted. That's how people burn out. So I take a really slow approach to life. I realize that if I'm going to have multiple businesses, which I do, and I also want to live a life of ch like chilling and peaceful and just relaxing, because that's why we all work so hard, so we can one day chill, right? Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to wait till that one day. I want to chill now. So I do a beautiful balance of work, go outside and rest, come back and work, go outside and rest. And that's how I never burn out, because I'm okay with taking a slower pace, knowing that my success will be assured at the end of, let's say, five years or ten years, versus I'm going to work really hard and try to make it all happen in the, this year. 
it just doesn't work that way. I, at least I've found that to be true in my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's a question. I know that you're, you're a driven and ambitious lady and, and one of the things that I struggle with personally is funny you mentioned you're a Libra you're about balance I'm Sagittarius I'm all about the arrow going towards the target mm -hmm. and one of the things that I struggle with is balancing my drive and my aspiration with also just having a bit of patience and as you mm -hmm. said chilling just being like whoa David you don't have to save the world in the next seven days there's time to do this honor yeah. the process do you have any advice for how you balance being ambitious but also having some patience for the process yeah well you have to remember the process of the arrow the arrow doesn't go forward just by going forward the arrow has to be pulled back and so it's that pulling back that gives you that time to to kind of okay let me look at my surroundings am I filled am I like am I fulfilled am I happy do I have peace am I ready have I gotten myself prepared for this next adventure? Because you are launching arrows all the time throughout your life. So we have all these goals and we have all these ambitions and we have all these desires that we want to change or create and bring about in this world. But it, at the end of your life, you're going to look back and go, okay, what did I do and how did I contribute? And I like to think of my contribution to life is not how many goals I achieved or how fast I attained them, but rather the energy in which I uh, exuded through each moment of that process. So, for example, let's say you're this high-achieving CEO who's done all these friggin' awesome goals, but the energy that you brought to each moment of the day was a little stressed, a little panicky, a little anxiety because, oh my god, I got all these fucking deadlines and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying, right? So think about what color that energy is emitting from them. It's a little, eh, it's a little murky, right? Because it's not pure, it's not like in love and peace and joy and all those high vibrating energies, right? And let's go, let's play, let's paint a different picture. Let's now paint a picture of someone who's more relaxed about life, still wants to do things in this world, but they just calm, take a little bit slower. Maybe it takes an extra hour to get this done or maybe an extra week, but their energy, their, their approach was more joyous and more peaceful and a little bit more loving and, and laughing the whole time. What kind of energy or color that they would paint the world with? right? It's more beautiful and, and vibrant and, and, and pure. So at the end of your life, look back at what kind of energy you exuded into the world. Sure, you have a double my list of accomplishments, but how did you feel while you were doing it? So to me, that's how I like to look at life is, yeah, I have 10,000 things on my to-do list and my dreams that I will achieve. Like, I thought of them, they came to me, they're meant to be achieved through me. I write them down and I say, okay, when the time is right. And so for me, I just do one thing at a time. And I look back and I realize how much further I am compared to a lot of other people who are scattering their energy everywhere and they're stressed about it. So for me, I like to think of life as what kind of energy are you contributing to the projects that you're creating and the goals that you're attaining? I think that's the most important is to know that what, you, what energy you put into it is what contributes to the world and then what you get back from the world too. You were talking there about higher energies and higher vibrations of which love is, is the highest, uh, I'm sure you would agree. I don't think there's enough love in the world right now. And even if there was, I think we can always do better. What do you think we can do to bring more of that energy into the world as individuals and also as a collective? Yeah, well, just like you said, it's an individual process. Like collectively it will happen when the individual makes the change and the change looked like this for me I would get in front of the mirror I'd put my clothes on and say I'm fat I'm fat I'm fat I'm fat I'm fat I'm fat right guess what energy I'm contributing to the world I don't like myself I don't love myself I'm not good enough I'm not worthy all of this energy is being pushed out into the world so here's the simple shift I made you talk a lot about rewriting your story well this was the biggest piece for me in rewriting my story that changed the course of my life I shifted one simple sentence and it made all the difference in the world. 
the words I am are a very powerful statement that manifest whatever it is you say after it, right? And so when I kept saying I'm fat, even though I was working out and dieting and doing all this stuff, my intention was stronger than the action I was taking. So if we can just shift our intention on the inside, that will make all the difference in the world. And my shift looked like this. I'm fat. I'm beautiful. So simple. It took effort. It was uncomfortable. You said ch change takes work. You don't just say I decided to change and then nothing and then like you just sit there. No, you got like like you got to do the work like you talked about. And so my work looked like this. Every time I heard myself say I'm fat or anything negative about myself, I would say cancel. And then I would reframe it to something more positive and more loving. And it always came back down to I am beautiful, I am lovable, I am funny, I am kind, I am creative. Like I would say the things that felt good to me. And when you can consciously choose to put yourself in a state of feeling good, then you're contributing more of that loving and light energy to the world. So if we want to bring more love to this world, we have to bring more love to ourselves. It's called self-love <laughs> because no one but yourself can do that. Mm -hmm. So if we want to if we want to see more love in this world, which is totally my mission, this is why I'm here. Um, peace and love, guys. Like bring him back the hippie <laughs> lifestyle. Because I mean, look at what has happened without peace and love. Like yeah. nobody wants that. We all underneath what we've learned and the bad habits we've picked up, there is that love that's just waiting to be tapped into. And so if we want to contribute more love to this planet, we have to start with ourselves. So find that area in your life, because all of us are confident somewhere, but find that area where you limit yourself from receiving love. Um, and I think that will be the first starting point on making those changes and bringing more love to the world is actually having courage to turn inside and look at your truth and go, okay, what have I been doing? How I've been treating myself? Like, oh, man, I, you know, like just take responsibility, and it takes courage to do that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, courage, courage is huge, and uh, really taking that step is is the key. You're ne you're never going to change without taking that step, and yeah, it's definitely scary. Um, but the thing is, I listened to an interview with Jamie Fox, and he said that on the other side of fear, there's nothing. We build up all these stories in our head of what it's going to be like and then when we actually take the step we realize that all of these things that we imagined aren't true at all so yeah i think having cu courage is a big part of bringing love into the world because it's it's courageous to be vulnerable and it's courageous to be sensitive especially the way that sometimes that can be treated and reacted to in the world just now david i can completely agree with what jamie fox says about on the other side of fear there is nothing i actually experienced it firsthand in my life where uh, my husband and I on our first wedding anniversary I wanted to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone so we um, flew up to Vancouver or Whistler Canada and went bungee jumping off a bridge in the mountains <laughs> and I was so excited I was so pumped up I booked it I was ready to go Chris is like are you crazy I'm like a little but I think this is gonna be fun so we're driving, we get to this bridge, we hike up the mountain, and it's literally a great graded bridge from mountain peak to mountain peak with a river that runs through it. It's one of the tallest ones in the world, 160 feet or something like that. I get on the bridge and I'm like, oh, I'm being a little, I'm so scared. I was terrified. You know when you get so scared you have to pee so bad? Like, I did, whatever. Like, it was so scary, David. I was freaking out. I'm like, with the rope snaps like this, like mountains, river, it's cold, there's snow on the ground, like, oh my God, what are we doing? What are we doing? And of course, if you know anything about my relationship, I'm the experiment, I'm the guinea pig. I'm the one that just says, yeah, I'll try it. And so of course, who goes first? Me. And so I get on the edge of the platform. I'm looking down. Do you know how far 160 feet is when you have to <laughs> choose to jump? Just, hey, just jump. No big deal. Like, talk about scary. So I'm standing on the edge of the platform. I'm shaking. I'm literally holding death grip. The guy's got his hand in my back pushing me because he's like, honey, you got to go. I'm like, I can't. I can't. I look back at Chris like with terror in my face. Like, I'm so scared. I literally said to him, I'm so scared. And then all of a sudden I feel someone push me. And I'm like, oh, shit. And the second my feet left the platform, David, the second fear disappeared. It was like it just went poof. Like it was all this cloud that just dissipated. And I was present. That's the difference. 
because fear is a thought process in the future of all the things that could go wrong. It's not actually happening. Danger is real. If there's a bear in the room, get the fuck out. But fear is you projecting into the future all the things that are going to go wrong. Chris says worry is living in the future and planning to fail. The second my feet left the platform, you better believe I was present. I'm like, woo, I'm falling, and that water's getting really close. But I was present. And so I just remember the second my feet left the platform, it was like whew, this lightness, and I'm floating, and that water's getting close. But I felt so peaceful when the 30 minutes to an hour before that jump, I built up all this crazy energy. I, I literally scared the piss out of myself. And it was all imagined, all of it. There was no real fear. I mean, yes, OK, there's some danger involved in that. I do get that. But you understand, the second my feet left that platform, everything I was imagining was irrelevant because I was in the present moment and none of that was happening. So I truly believe that fear disappears the moment we stop projecting it. Brittany, I'm aware that we only have your presence for a, a short time today, so I've got a couple of final questions to wrap yeah. up with. The first of which is we've talked a little bit about learning, conditioning, the patterns and processes that are inbuilt into us. And I think there's something we can do better with in personal development because most of us come into personal development as adults and we've got all these scripts and all these programmings already built in that we've got to unwrite and unravel and create new ones for ourselves. What I'd like to do in my work as, as time goes on is start to bring these principles into younger people so they don't have to do the rewriting and the reprogramming. They already have the good scripts and the good programs from an early age. So my question is, if I had a five-year-old here right now and you had to give them advice, philosophy, wisdom to help them live a life of fulfillment, what would you say to that five-year-old? That's such a brilliant question. And it's so true. We have to start younger because by age 11, the critical factor is formed. And that is all the conditioning, all the beliefs, all the no's that we've been told our entire childhood get like formed as, OK, this is our reality. This is our belief system. And it isn't until we're adults that we start to choose to deprogram all of that stuff. So it's so funny you asked me that because just last week, I had a five-year-old in my hair salon oh. getting teal highlights in her hair. And the mom said, am I a terrible mother for letting my five-year-old like put teal like highlights in her hair? I said, no, you're the kind of mother that we need in this world because who's to say teal hair is like a bad thing to do for a five-year-old? I said, I'm creating unicorns early. So I loved that we started at five years old putting blue in their hair. So stop telling children no. That's what we got to do. We got to stop telling them no all the time. Like, let them get hurt. Let them try it. Let them burn their hand. They won't touch it again. I promise you that. <laughs> let them learn and stop trying to be this perfect parent to dictate, like, how it should be done. And they're not doing it right. And what are other people going to think about my kid or about me if they have blue hair? Who gives a shit? We got to stop. First, we got to stop caring about what other people think. And second, we got to stop telling our kids no. And we just got to let them live. Like, let them live. Put the blue hair. Let them have blue hair. <laughs> <laughs> so my advice is just to let them figure it out on their own. Because what I've learned is that these five-year-olds, they know wisdom. They yeah. know truth. They are tapped into that universal consciousness of love without being burdened by all these like no's and this is how it's supposed to be and society says you can't love the same sex and blah 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 blah. These children know and anytime I'm in the presence of a young child I ask the first thing I ask them why are you here? What's your purpose? Because they know. I have had so many kids tell me profound things where I'm like and the parents are like what? I'm, I didn't know that. Like, Because you talk to them like they're a five-year-old but these five-year-olds have the wisdom of like a 500-year-old. So we got to start remembering that these children, just because they're little beings, doesn't mean that they aren't a, a, a direct connection and source tap to 
infinite wisdom and love. If we look at children, we see how fearless they are. They're, they're born with confidence. It's not until we get programmed to not love ourselves or not believe in ourselves. So my, we don't need to fix these children. We just need to stop trying to change them. That's really what we need to do is just let them be. They are smart enough and wise enough to figure it out. <laughs> what are you grateful for, Brittany? Oh, man, I'm grateful for everything. Every moment is an opportunity to express gratitude. I'm grateful that I'm alive. I'm grateful that I have a partner that supports me. I'm grateful that I have the space to share my story with people who are listening and, and, and uncovering that for themselves. I'm grateful... Uh, that this experience only lasts a short period on this planet. <laughs> uh, because this is not it, guys. This is, we're, this is the dream. We think that when we go to sleep at night, that's the dream. That's the real life. That's where we come from. That's who we are. That's what we are. This is just a short period of time. So what am I grateful for? I'm grateful for the short period of time I have here to shine my light, to leave a, 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 a legacy of love, and um, to express my creativity and I'm mostly grateful for not giving a shit what other people think because that to me is ultimate freedom. You preempted my next question with your uh, your psychic powers there. I was going to say, well, you know I am psychic. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned there that, yeah, we do have a short time here. This is a short experience and ultimately one day we're all going to have that final day and, and when you ultimately reach yours, what legacy would you like to have left during the time that you had with us here on Earth? Yes, obviously a legacy of love. <laughs> it's funny because when I said the phrase, it actually got rearranged in my mind. They're like, no, I'll say this phrase. So I think that's really fascinating and something to point out. People need to pay attention that we already have everything we need inside of us. Like, we just have to pay attention. What kind of legacy do I want to leave? Really, I'm here to birth peace. I want to create a world where we aren't afraid to be ourselves, where we aren't afraid to hug someone else and say, you know what, you're amazing. I love you. It's so interesting to me that, you know, David, you and I met at um, uh, Experts Academy where everyone on day two and three was hugging yeah. and high-fiving and listening to each other's dreams and we support you and we believe in you and then when I come home I look at the people I cross in the hallway or stand in an elevator with and they're just like <laughs> and it's so different and yeah. I realize that we can live in a world where we're connected where we're supportive where we're loving so to me the legacy I want to leave is is I want to be remembered as having a heart of gold. It, if you've interacted with me, if you've crossed my path, I want you to feel lighter and more in love and more capable and confident in yourself because I used to pride myself on being an asshole. My nickname was Bitchney. And I was and that was my, that was like my defense. That was how I protected myself. That was how I kept people away. And I want to completely erase that. Do the 360 opposite, you know, whatever, 180, whatever. I, colors are my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to, I just want, when people are around me, I want people to go, wow, it's okay to just relax and have a good time. I really can just, like, love life because I find far too often that so many people are waiting for permission or, or there's a certain agenda that has to happen, but you really can just be happy and peaceful and loving right now. Nothing needs to change. You don't, you don't have to change anything. You could just, uh, besides the choice of being loving and peaceful. <laughs> so, Brittany, for people who've been listening and they've resonated with your story, uh, resonated with the principles that you shared with us today, and would like to find out a little bit more about you and the work that you do, where would you direct them to as the best place to find out more? Yeah, thank you. Again, thank you for having me. I'm grateful for this opportunity to connect with other people who care about making positive changes in the world. I think what you're doing is incredible, and I think anyone listening is also that type of person, that light worker, that person who is here to do better and to 
really step into who they are and allow their light to shine. So if you want to come hang out with me, I suggest following me on Instagram at the world by Brit. That's with one T. And something I love to offer, because we're talking a lot about being authentic and, and learning to love yourself and just being comfortable with who you are, I have a free video series called Awaken Your Authentic Self that I'd love to offer. If you go to BrittanyCarmichael.com slash awaken, that will um, get you into the three-part free empowerment series that will help you to remove those limiting labels. All the knows that you were told as a kid, we're going to pull those off. We're going to break through the beliefs that hold you back from shining your light and really owning your authenticity and your confidence. Because once you can do that, like I said, that's true freedom. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with this. Georgia O'Keeffe said, I've settled it for myself that all compliments and criticisms will go down the same drain and I'm quite free. And when you can find that, when you can find your own self-love to where you don't care if other people love you or hate you, that, to me, is true freedom. And it is possible. Well, a wonderful note to, to end the interview on, Brittany. Thank you so much for coming on and being very outspoken and confident and uh, use the word shit a lot. <laughs> so I like be spiritual and cuss. It's okay. <laughs> and I think that really that really sums up your your attitude is not giving a shit and just really allowing who you are to come into the world. And I really appreciate you bringing yourself and that energy to this interview. So thank you very much. Absolutely, David. My first business card for OMG Hairstyles said, "Life is too short to look like shit." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, if that business card offends you, then you're not my client. <laughs> but it is, guys. My, it, life is too short to, to care about what other people think, to hold back, to play small. Life is too short. And David, you and I both know that we aren't promised tomorrow, so it's important to live today. Absolutely. Brittany, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it hugely if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the podcast. With your review, please be as honest and detailed as you can be. Because with honest and detailed feedback, that helps me to adapt and grow this podcast to most serve you, the listener. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then make sure you subscribe to the podcast. That way you aren't going to miss any of the future episodes that we've got lined up for you. Until next time, remember that you are the author of your life. You hold the pen and you can write whatever script you want for yourself. So go out today and write yourself a beautiful story. <laughs>